This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. And this week we're talking about open source and construction, how they relate, what it, there is in construction that's a lot like open source, how open source principles are applied there. And we have a really great guest for that because she's moving out of one house, moving into another, building one while working on the other, but she comes from the software world. She's an open source person. Her name is Mary Hodder, and she's going to be with us. She's got a lot of good things to say to me and Aaron Newcomb, our co-host, and that's coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is Twit. Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 651, recorded Wednesday, October 13th, 2021, Open Source and Construction. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Command Line Heroes, an original podcast from Red Hat that tells the epic true tales of developers, programmers, hackers, geeks, and open source rebels who are revolutionizing the technology landscape. Season 8 is out now. Search for Command Line Heroes on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Hello again and good morning, good evening, or good whenever it is, wherever you are. I am Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly, and I am joined this week by Aaron Newcomb himself, who uh, should appear for those of you with visuals shortly. (laughs) He's sitting in the past at Computer Chronicles. I'm sitting at Computer Chronicles here with my buddies, uh, Stuart Chaffee and Gary Kildall. We were talking about this a little bit. Let's see, if I lean the right way, you can see, there, yeah, there he see. is. There's Stuart oh, yeah. in the background there, uh, working on an IBM PC 5150, the original PC, uh, which just celebrated like a, a oh. 40-year anniversary oh, no, uh, not too long ago. Years. So uh, pretty cool. But yeah, this is one of the things I love. You know, I'm a geek and I, I, I love computer history, so I love watching the computer chronicles because you know you go you really go back in time when you go back and watch those old shows like what was what was coming out in 1986 at uh you know ces or whatever uh back in the day so yeah pretty cool pretty fun yeah it was it was a great show i got to hang out in the studio a few times uh while that was going on i was working for a an analyst then uh, named jan lewis who's sort of like disappeared in history she was one of the original oh yeah i remember jan microsoft yeah. people yeah uh, Jan Lewis, who pronounced her name Lewis. <laughs> she had this interesting, interesting <laughs> she list. She did. She was fun. She was a lot of fun. Um, uh, and <laughs> anyway, and that, that was on Channel 60 out of San, uh, uh, San Mateo, the the, uh, the, uh, the the college there, College of San Mateo. And I think that's gone now, too. Um, but at least tapes of things exist. So our, Exactly. Our, our and they donated is, that. I don't know if it was Stewart's, but just in case anyone's right. interested... They donated yeah. that basically to for everyone to watch. So you can find it on the Internet Archive. You can find it on YouTube, uh, which is where I watch it. And just a short plug, if you want to go back and watch, uh, what was it, Triangulation, I think. Uh, there's an episode where Leo interviews Stuart about the show oh, wow. and the history and everything. So if you want to learn more about it, yeah. go back and watch that episode of Triangulation. It was really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, they were, they were a lot of fun. So our, our subject today is... Building construction, connecting that with open source. Have you built anything? Have you? Are you? Are you on top of that? Are, are you? A, I do. I I'm a woodworker. Remodeling. Yeah, I am absolutely. Yeah, I built uh, yeah. built-in bookshelves for uh, you know in my. Well, this is the first thing I did when we moved into our current house about ten years ago. Uh, so I don't do like you know construction proper, like build houses from the ground up. But I do a lot of DIY stuff. You know, all my light switches yeah. are you know on the remote controlled with microcontrollers and things like that. And, and I do a lot of woodworking. So absolutely. I do a lot of building. Yeah. Yeah. So our, our guest is Mary Hodder, who's in the middle of, of a lot of that. She's moving to one place while fixing up another. And, and I've had a lot of experience with that, meaning that my wife has had it and I've hung out, you know, and, but, but she's been the, the one sort of taking the lead on it. Um, and I want to, I want to jump onto the show, but first I have to let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Command Line Heroes, an original podcast from Red Hat. Command Line Heroes tells the epic true tales of developers, programmers, hackers, geeks, and open source rebels who are revolutionizing the technology landscape. It offers a unique blend of historical context and current trends shaping the tech landscape. This season tackles one question from every angle. What is a robot? 
a servant, a factory worker, a prosthetic, a vehicle? Why do we build robots that look like us? And we often ask whether we can trust robots, but can robots trust us? Science fiction tells many stories about robots. In the future, they will serve our every need, or maybe they'll develop a mind of their own and turn against us. Maybe they'll be the savior of humanity or our downfall. Season 8 of Command Line Heroes covers the robots that are in our midst and the determined dreamers who bring them to life. Eight episodes compare the promise of science fiction to the reality of robots today. I had a chance to listen to the first episode of Robot as Servant, and it was really interesting. Here's a clip. While making this season, we discovered a robot reality that's pretty removed from the robots we imagine. And yet, all those misguided ideas about what a robot should be actually shaped what robots are. And no robot fiction shaped things more than the story we told ourselves about robotic servants. This award-winning podcast is hosted by Sir Anjit Barak and produced by Red Hat. Season 8 is out now. Search for Command Line Heroes on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts. We'll also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to Command Line Heroes for their support. So um, I want to get onto our uh, onto our topic here. It's it's open source and construction. I don't think anybody knows more, especially on the construction side, and building your next home and getting rid of the last one while fixing it up, than our guest today, which is who is Mary Hodder. Mary, I've known I think since the last millennium. Um, I know we certainly got to know each other as bloggers way back when. Um, uh, mm-hmm. She had a a really seminal interesting, uh, forward looking and dealing with the present at the time blog called Napsterization. And that was, that'll date it too, back when Napster was a thing, uh, before it was killed. Uh, but, um, but Mary's been on top of all sorts of stuff and, and, um, uh, she's been a, a, a multiple entrepreneur, uh, as a founder, she's done usability and UX research. She's been a, a, a user advocate, um, She's definitely that on the board of Customer Commons, which I am also. Um, uh, it helped co-found that. Uh, she founded Dabble.com in 05, had a mobile app called Wellness Mobile to self-track and share one's own wellness in 09. Uh, she's lived, uh, worked in large and small organizations, all kinds of stuff. Usability is really big in, in her in her world. So without going too farther into that, she can either correct me or just move on to our topic at hand. Are you there, Mary? Yes, I'm is. here. <clears throat> in her, in the house she's leaving. If I'm right about this, right? Is that the place? Yes, in, yes. In Silicon Valley, but newly tiled, <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah, new that's... new uh, new plugs, and you know all the stuff. So uh, yeah, new windows, new lots of new stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, and um, and and you and you've been you've lived in well, you're from California, and you've you went to Berkeley, yes. but you've lived in Silicon Valley. And worked in Silicon Valley almost your whole life, except for you're going to Seattle now, right? Yes. I'm actually <laughs> a fourth generation Californian and did not expect to move <laughs> uh, out of state ever, really. Um, <laughs> but I, we decided to do it for a number of reasons. And part of it is just Silicon Valley has gotten too ridiculous. And we wanted a more humane lifestyle, maybe. That's one way to put it. Um, so we, uh, we decided to go north also climate change and some other issues. Um, and for now, Seattle is just like California in 1980. Very friendly <laughs> and very oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, we were just up in Seattle, actually. My daughter's going to Seattle University and uh, I had the same feeling. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't in California. I just moved here 11 years ago. Uh, so I wasn't in California then, but it, it 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 did feel a little bit like going back in time. It's like, oh, this is this yeah. is probably very similar to what the Bay Area was like, you know, uh, twenty years yeah. ago or so, thirty years ago. Yeah, it's really um, people are really nice. I mean, they they say, and these are just stats that I hear it, that right here in Mountain View and in this greater kind of Silicon Valley area, that about sixty percent of the people are involved in some way in tech, but in Seattle proper, that's more like ten percent. And 
Um, you know, people in Seattle aren't too thrilled with people in tech showing up too much because they <laughs> like Seattle. They have slogans about keep Seattle nice and keep Seattle weird, right? Because when you bring in a lot of money, um, it raises rents and people who are doing weird, artistic, DIY, interesting projects and things, you know, um, everything from the Fremont Parade that happens every June to well, not the last two years because of the pandemic, but, you know, uh, all these kinds of efforts are um, predicated on having kind of a, a less expensive cost of living. And so they don't really like seeing tech moving in as much as it has, but it's also changed the culture. And, you know, there's certainly some referencing in the local discussions about how, you know, oh, those tech people are coming and they're rude and whatever, but, uh, you know, it, it's it is a distinct there is a distinct difference between the bay area mountain view and being in seattle i just feel like everything just relaxes down it's just very chill in comparison yeah and they are doing a lot of construction up there when i was uh when we went up a, uh, a few weeks ago i mean construction was everywhere downtown what roads were blocked off i mean so it's it's definitely growing and I'm wondering, you know, it makes me wonder yeah. how many of those buildings are getting new modern uh, uh, technology in the building as they as they build them up from the yeah. ground up or build on top of existing buildings. You know, that's an interesting point because, um, you know, there's a thing called the LEED standard. It's an acronym and I've forgotten what LEED stands for, but um, architects and builders get certified in it and, and then you can build a building that is certified in it and the cities love to build lead buildings right because then they can talk about how green everything is but the re the interesting reality and I know this from um, some of the work that I've done around Mountain View and in Seattle about density because I'm all for I mean we clearly have an affordable housing crisis and we need to build or retrofit older buildings for affordable housing. Um, we're not really having a, a luxury housing crisis, but that's what the developers love to do is build luxury because um, that's where they make the money. But anyway, uh, there is a huge amount of building going on in Seattle and they love to do Leeds development, which is kind of a green standard, right? Low energy use, um, green materials, et cetera. But in some ways, it's kind of meaningless. Like it's it's just sort of a format, stamp it out. It's a little bit like the GDPR. It's like, how can we follow it to the letter of the law, but not really follow the spirit of the law, which is about protecting people's data in a better way, right? And so it's, it's a little bit frustrating to see some of that. Uh, you know, you see buildings advertised as Leeds buildings, and yet we know from studies that, for example, in Chicago, the Center for Tall Buildings, which is very pro tall buildings, did some studies that unfortunately didn't come out in their favor, which is, yes, there we go, it's on the screen. Um, so it's leadership and energy and environmental design. There we go. So, uh, but the Center for Tall Buildings has done a couple of studies and I can provide the links after and, and uh, you guys can post them with this. But basically, building to about the tree line gets you a huge amount of energy savings because um, buildings naturally cool in the summer with the tree line and there's a distinct temperature difference as you go up then there's the next plateau is like five to seven stories and then the next plateau is around 12. And once you go above 12 and many of those downtown seattle buildings that are being built are like 30 40 stories Right, it's just in many ways an environmental disaster because you just have this enormous amount of cooling and heating, the amount of steel, the engineering for it has a high carbon footprint, and yet they'll go and get the lead stamp. <laughs> and, you know, and you sort of think, yeah, this is not really what, uh, it, this is not following in the spirit of the Leeds standard, but so be it. It's an, it is an open standard in some ways. So I don't, I don't know if people caught this earlier, but my phone rang. I hadn't turned it off. We have a we have a plumber coming. This is really appropriate to our topic um, uh, in yeah. the in the condo that we're renting here. And I 
explicitly told him, here's the time not to call. <laughs> so this is the one time he called. <laughs> it's, it's part of how this stuff works, right? And But what's relevant about this is that the, the, uh, he's actually here to, to, to look at the, um, at the uh, he's a refrigeration guy too. So he's looking at the uh, refrigerator, the refrigerator died. So the refrigerator is actually a nice one and it's not that old. Um, but before that, <laughs> another guy who's also a plumber came and, and looked at our uh, dishwasher, right? And so the dishwasher is also dead. And the dishwasher is what's called a, it's a no name. And they call this a builder's special. There might be a bit more appropriate name for this, but it's <laughs> one where we're building a, we're building a bunch of condos here. We're building a whole bunch of things. You got to have a dishwasher. Here's a dishwasher. <laughs> it's not like one you would go out and buy. Right. And, uh, and, right. and that just died. And where I want to go with this is that there is, in the vernacular of construction, um, as you just pointed out with the leads thing, the corner is going to be cut everywhere. And sometimes you cut them consciously, sometimes you cut them unconsciously. But trying to, to, to reconcile the, the need to have a working building with the need to cheap out is a pretty tough thing to do. And I'm wondering if you had some thoughts about that, Mary. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I mean, there are so many ways that we could go down paths around you know, plumbing, electrical appliances, um, the way that you waterproof, the way that you, um, the way that you protect areas that could get water over time, right? So bathrooms and kitchens are typical for that or a bar. If somebody has a bar in a living room or something like that, um, that, you know, and the standards change quickly. So let me give an example. So, so there's the building code, which most states have, although, just as an example, I believe Texas, I've heard, does not use a zoning or a building code. So those are two ways that municipalities can create standards, right, for what you're supposed to do. And in fact, our electrician is here today, and he is not allowed by his insurance, based on the code and the, the rules, he is not allowed to install anything or do anything that isn't up to current code, but we have an older home. And for example, we've asked him to put add a light here to the kitchen. Um, it's right up there. There's a hole cut for it. We just want to add a light in front of the refrigerator. It makes sense. But uh, the lights that we put in eight years ago under the old permit with the old code standard are just very different now. Um, and so we're having to retrofit together what we're doing. Um, another example is um, the plugs here. Uh, let me point oops, to this one. Mm -hmm. So the other one that was showing on my screen, sorry about that, and I see the lighting issue, but mm -hmm. this plug is tamper resistant. And uh, what that means is that there's little pieces of plastic inside where you put the, the plug. And that is to prevent kids from, I don't know, sticking a pair of scissors in there and electrocuting themselves, right? Um, and so, you know, we're at, we added a couple of plugs to the kitchen, right? And, but the old plugs aren't tamper resistant. And so, you know, we were, but we want all the plugs to look the same. So we changed all the plugs to be to the new standard. Um, you know, or for example, in our bathroom, we did a bathroom about eight or nine years ago, and the old standard was that you could use plywood underneath the thin set underneath the tile, um, mm -hmm. and that your grout at any 90 degrees was the same as all the flat tile. Now the standard is that you use caulk matching the grout at any 90 degree angle, right, or any joints, big joints. Um, so that if there's movement or cracking that you don't get water in there and then it doesn't go over to that plywood that is just plain old plywood and then blow up and then you have to redo all the tile. Um, so that's something that we recently dealt with because we had 90 degrees that had caulk and, or uh, grout instead of caulk and caulk is flexible and grout is not. And uh, so anyway, you know, you, you have those kinds of standards, right? And the workmen have to be up on it so that they're always working with the latest code by the municipality. And of course, each city has a slightly different version of the code. And then there's the state code that they adopt and modify. Um, so there's these different standards. Those codes are open, right? The 
AIA, which I think is the American Institute of Architects, participates a lot in code development, and so do big builders. And, but it's open. If you really were into it, you could, I think, go and get involved in the code development. And a new code comes out every two years. So even what happened in 2018 is different than the 2020 code, which we're working with now. Um, and so, you know, you, so you have that set of rules and standards that you have to comply with. Then there's just best practices so that the insurance of your, you know, provided to your workmen in their companies can then, you know, cover you. They have to do work to code and do things correctly or to certain standards. And then there's also what the manufacturers do, right? So you have, you have different manufacturers that are doing things, warranties, you can void the warranty. For example, this Marvin Ultimate window, if we modify the window, it voids the warranty, right? It's Douglas fir on the inside, it's anodized aluminum on the outside, and there's a whole system in the middle that's steel that allows the windows to open and all the stuff. And if we, if we even cut the wood, if we do anything beyond staining it or painting it, um, we, we void the warranty, right? And we don't want to do that. We want that warranty intact because these are expensive windows and we want them to last a long time and be covered if anything goes wrong. And so, you know, you just have a lot of different things. And then, of course, there's cost, to Doc's point about how, you know, you're trying to not spend too much money, especially a builder who's building maybe for a lower price point and then has uh, the need to make something that they can warranty for 10 years. Both California and Washington state require a 10 year warranty on uh, new builds and on large construction. So, you know, if the, if the overall contractor does it wrong, that's an issue. I actually get our permits and then we hire people to, you know, who are contractors to do things. So for example, we just restuccoed the outside of the house and the garage, two separate structures. And I learned a lot about waterproofing and standards around that, or, um, who the manufacturers are that create um, this thing called bichethane, which is this plastic coated, you know, something that can take um, somewhat high heat. Uh, and then of course, for certain areas where you have really high heat, um, maybe something that's going to get a lot of afternoon sun and really potentially heat up. You have to graduate to an even higher level of waterproofing material, and then you have to apply it correctly and, you know, put the materials over it that look good because that's the thing that we all see. And that's the usability of the building, right? You're going to step onto the step and underneath it, it has the membrane that's going to keep your building waterproof. Um, and did you get the right standard for heat and, Everything. I mean, there's just so much to know. And so I've really learned a lot um, doing this house. We did basically what would I think a normal homeowner or for what would be normal for us, you know, 10 projects. We would do one at a time in the past. And I did all 10 at once over the last nine months. And so I've, I'm here every day. I work with all the guys and I have to be really knowledgeable and kind of one step ahead to get materials and understand all these different pieces, the code, the rules. What does the inspector want, right? Like he comes in and says, well, I don't really care about this part, but I really, really care about that part. And then you, you work to that standard as well. And that's kind of a fluid moving thing. So you want to work with your inspector early to understand what they really care about. And uh, we happen to have a fantastic inspector. I love him. Um, he's super knowledgeable. He worked in the building trades for a long time. And he also came, and I think he likes what we're doing because it's quality work and quality materials. And we want to do everything right. Like we're really dedicated to that and thinking ahead and getting stuff right. And so he has come in and just been fantastic because he loves seeing a good job, you know? And so anyway, those are kind of the factors that we deal with and, you know, and then there's time moving on, right? Like the dishwasher that goes out, what do you do? Or our fridge had a problem and, you know, I just ordered, it's a seven-year-old fridge. It's out of the five-year warranty that I purchased the extended warranty. So I bought the part on partsdirect.com, the $89 for a slide for the freezer drawer and installed it myself, which took five minutes. But, you know, I have to track down all the right stuff and, 
get it in there and the fridge is actually doing great. So we kind of want to keep it. Um, but anyway, uh, so those are some of the factors I think that, you know, people have to deal with. And I'm of course describing a construction level that is, you know, on a homeowner level, right? A single home or whatever. In Seattle, we built a cottage from the ground up, 800 square feet. Um, and so uh, we had that experience as well. And then we've done a lot of other remodeling as, as well. But I'm my specific work on our own, our own properties is at that level. That said, I've also worked for, prior to my work in tech, I worked for a forensic engineer where we would take apart big construction projects um, way at the other end of this, right? So the kinds of stuff we would work on were um, the San Francisco library, right after it was built. Um, there was a lot of shenanigans, let's say, with the schedule and the engineering, the permitting, the um, you know, lots of different things. They were required by the city to do, follow lots of rules, but the developer was also trying to make money. And so, you know, they would schedule the mud and tape guy on the same day as the sheetrock guy doesn't work and then schedule the painter on that same day, right? Like in you all in the same room, that totally doesn't work, right? And um, obviously, but they hit, would hide it in the software. And so we did schools we did um, the redo of the San Francisco City Hall building, which is the big old capital looking building um, on Venice. And, you know, so we would take apart these things and I would take apart the software, um, which is why after that job, I got into tech because I was like, software is way more fun, you know, than, <laughs> than uh, doing legal work. But in any event, so that's my experience is I had this either really large construction experience um, really big jobs and figuring out usually with a court case behind them, right? Like you're, you're doing it to a standard of evidence and stuff. And then it's all this, right. And trying to figure out how to do it in our own home and, and get it right. So anyway, that's, so, that's, you know what I know. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I, I, I know Ant, our technical engineer had a question, which I think is probably a good one at this point where, cause you were talking about software, uh, which is, you know, what, software tools do you use? So you, I mean, you you have some background in this obviously, but you're not a licensed uh, plumber or something. So you've got to keep up on all these standards. So what's the right. software that you use? I'm assuming there's some software. You're not like looking at books, right? To like try to figure out the code. No, the internet is my software. <laughs> um, I spend probably uh, 13, 14 hours a day on my computer and off with the guys, right? Researching, um, understanding what the local code is and then how to apply it, researching parts and materials, um, figuring out uh, solutions to, you know, because you're retrofitting an older home. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of different requirements. And then, of course, we want things to look cool, right? Because it needs to look cool. So, uh, and look, um, look modern and interesting and yet in sync with a hundred year old house. So there's you know, just many different things, but the internet is my friend. Um, I do occasionally use written materials, um, books on certain kinds of um, woodworking or uh, solving particular problems. And also, you know, magazines, things where, you know, you can look at what somebody else has done to solve a particular problem in an older house how to manage something. But for the most part, it's the internet and looking up specs and standards and um, trying to figure out how, uh, what is current because it's all changing very quickly. Yeah. Um, and then of course, there's one other thing that I want to point out right over here. Um, yeah. I don't know if you can see, but we have, we're not quite done. There's a fourth uh, switch coming, but these are, switches that are push button, but they're LED dimmable, they're new. And uh, they, so, you know, these, these lights, I don't know if you can see that, but basically, um, you know, we have all these down lights and they're, um, I'm moving the, the dimmer here on the bottom. And then we have, you know, more lights and more dimming and whatnot. Um, these are newly manufactured. They're made uh, for House of Antique Hardware. Um, dot com is the site. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
um, you know, they're, they're trying to create things that look old, but have new technology. And what's interesting about these particular things, because we've had them in the house for a decade, um, is that early on, we were getting LED bulbs, you know, back when they were $25 a bulb and stuff. And we wanted LED dimmable bulbs and things. And those older versions um, just weren't quite there yet. And so we've had to replace a lot of those switches. And now the new ones are extremely reliable. And uh, and so, you know, that's what we're putting throughout the house or in order to have, again, a look and feel, but and yet have the current functionality of LED, dimmable, low energy use, um, you know, functionality that, you know, you, you, you want. And so anyway, um, it's just, it's just interesting trying to do, you know, juggle everything. Um, but that said, I mean, uh, and I've learned a lot about, although I'm totally not an expert in electrical, um, our electrician is the best one that I've worked with so far out of a dozen electricians over the years. And he's been teaching me about voltage and watt use and how much load you can do on things. And I mean, it's so you have all that factoring as well. Um, yeah. But there's, it's just, it's a lot, there's a lot to, to know, but the internet is the only way that I can keep up with it because of the just constant changing. But thank goodness that there are places and people who put all the old manuals, all the old specs online somewhere, even if things kind of age off. And so you can go back and look at old stuff and look at new stuff and figure it out. Yeah. I wanted to ask, I wanted to put, um, I want to ask a couple of questions. I know Doc has questions too. One of the questions I want to ask goes back to what you were talking about, the code. And I'm trying to figure out whether that's a good paradigm or not, building code uh, as compared to open source. I mean, building code is open in the sense that everybody has access to it. It, it keeps a certain standard. It's more of an open standard, I guess, really. It's not open source because yes. not everybody can can jump in and contribute to it, right? But it is at least an open standard. I'm trying to like figure out, I mean, we are an open source show anyway, so I'm trying to bring it back around to open source a little bit. Mm -hmm. but, um, right. but is there a paradigm there? And is that paradigm changing, do you think? Um, I don't. First of all, I think for people in the trades and cities and contractors, who, you know, the kind of the over, overarching person, which in this, in our case is me, um, you know, the building code is actually terrific in many ways, even though it's annoying, right? People complain and, oh, it's so terrible. Especially in California. Us do X, <laughs> y, and Z. Yeah, but, but in many ways, it's fantastic because it means that, A, if I go and buy a property, in theory, um, everything was done to code, um, even if it wasn't done with a permit. And, um, not disclosing work that wasn't just to code in theory would put the old owners on the hook. Um, now that's another messy process that hopefully nobody ever has to get into, but we know sometimes happens. Um, but the, that standard is supposed to protect both buildings and people who are currently there, right? You don't want to have a fire. Um, you don't want to have a flood or, you know, have problems that, um, or just make the building a disaster. Um, but at the same time, um, there is the practical reality of making it all kind of work um, and making sure that, you know, you can actually complete what you're doing and, and um, get it signed off. Um, I think there's, uh, my experience is that there's a lot more complaining than our actual problems um, mm. with the building code. And you're very much right that it is an open standard. Um, there is, there are ways to participate in it, but I, it's like that has got to be just like a mind numbing thing. I would never <laughs> want to participate. Leave that to other people. It's already mind numbing keeping all this going, you know. So, it's uh, there's an awful lot to know. And then, of course, you know, you always have the wild cards too of, you know. Um, your neighbors complain, right? We had our, our neighbors turned us in for having no permits and our inspector came in and com explained that he's the inspector on all of our permits and we actually are fully permitted. And so, but you know, you have 
uh, you just stuff happens, right? You just have to be sort of ready for anything. And so with the code piece, um, my feeling is, is that codes and permits to, you know, a fair extent actually um, protect you and uh, are, are good in a lot of ways. And for, I mean, I'm, I feel like a very knowledgeable home owning person who does this kind of stuff. I've really learned a lot. Most people don't know anything and they just do stuff, right? They like open mm -hmm. things and disconnect things and they just, it's, they create problems, right? And so having standards that tries to mitigate for that um, is a good thing, you know, but <laughs> I want to jump back in here. Uh, <laughs> before I go into the plugs, I just to say my screen just went really blank and I wanted to like send a note. I thought I can't send a note. My screen went blank. Anyway, <laughs> I, I need to let you all know. <laughs> anyway, I want to let you all know that, uh, that we have this wonderful thing called club twit. Uh, club twit is seven bucks a month, but it gives you so much more of, for one thing, it gives, gives you podcasts like this one ad free. Um, and that's, that's worth something to people. Um, and uh, it's, it's members only. There's a bonus feed. There's a Discord. Uh, all of our shows and more are, are, uh, are on Club Twit. Um, there's bonus material from all of the shows, kind of like the outtakes that we have. Um, there's, uh, there's what goes on before the show. There's what goes on after the show. There's all these digressions that are truly interesting and worth something. And that's in the membership fee too. And I want to add that there is, especially for us floss people, a uh, Linux show uh, hosted on Club Twit on the on the weekends. Um, and that's hosted by Jonathan Bennett, who's one of our co-hosts here. It's a great show. He's a great he's a great host for that one. So dig it, it's Club Twit. And um, there's a link for that that I'm not seeing right now, but it's not, it's, <laughs> it's it shouldn't be hard to find. There you go, twit.tv slash twit.tv slash club twit, unless I'm corrected by the by the voice in my earphones. Um, so, uh, uh, so Mary, a couple of things. One is, um, uh, I I want to I want to get to you know dealing with. Well, there are two things, and I want to because this is in the front of my mind right now. I'll just throw it in because we've, we rebuilt a lot of houses that, you know, you know, my wife and I really well and, uh, starting in the late nineties. And, um, the first one we did, there was a really great book, which I don't, I haven't looked it up. I, maybe I can look it up later called your new house. And I don't know who did it, but the opening line in the book is your builder is not Bob Vila. Your builder is a crew of drunks, ex felons, and misfits who show up on alternate Thursdays. <laughs> so obviously, you have a good relationship. That's really with what funny. You, call, you it is, I know, <laughs> with what you call your guys there. I know our our, our first house that we 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 rebuilt. Uh, there were a bunch of Tongans, and they were fantastic. You know, the the the, mm -hmm. the foreman was he taught math, <laughs> and he built houses, um, but. Part of it, 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 it's, it, there's a connection to the software business too, and and, and to open source. You know, you know, you're kind of like the maintainer on this thing, right? And you're 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 bringing in commits. You know, your foreman is mm -hmm. is a is a is a committer or maintainer. You know, it, pick pick yeah. your pick your term. Um, I have a feeling it's not a whole lot different than the software business in some ways. It actually feels incredibly even. similar. Yeah. It, it feels incredibly similar to me. So I, when I'm doing some kind of software project, I'm typically doing a combination of project management and the usability and what I call pair programming, where I sit next to the software engineer and we work through, maybe we've done some research, um, qualitative, quantitative research, and we apply what we've learned and we make decisions and we look at the code and figure out like what's going to work because um, on the engineering side, there's reasons why you make decisions in the architecture that um, maybe don't work for the users, but maybe there's a real reason why it is a certain way, but maybe you can brainstorm a way around that problem. So maybe you don't really change the architecture, but you figure out another way to get the users what they need. Um, that feels a lot of like what I do with all the guys who are here who are building. 
and especially retrofitting an old building. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's an awful lot of um, juggling and making people aware of all the requirements, right? Because if it was just left to the builders, I mean, they would do what worked for them, right? And a lot of what works for them, just like a software engineer is um, whatever they've been doing all along, right? Like they'll keep going with that, but it may not work for the requirements of the project and the overall use and all of that. So, um, you know, that's, that's definitely a consideration. Another thing that um, I kind of find fascinating is the requirements around cost, right? And you have this in a software project, right? You're, um, you, you, you know, the, the labor costs what it costs. And uh, maybe in software, you don't have as many uh, materials issues. Um, you're certainly not like buying wood that doubles every two months, um, which has been going on for the last nine months in the pandemic or whatever. Uh, but um, but there's still things that you're you're trying to do, are trying to deal with, and um, it feels like uh, a lot of building is incredibly similar. It's product development. There's a much more immediate um, response, let's say, or uh, effect that you can have. I mean, obviously, if you update some software and you push it live or push it at least to your, your test team, um, you can see it, you can in a way touch it like in the device or something, um, you know, use it. But, um, you know, when we installed this tile two weeks ago and then grouted it last week, you know, that was, it's very tactile, right? Like you, you, um, everybody immediately saw it uh, where before we were putting it in, and I find this is true a lot in software as well, we'll architect something, some information, uh, a process, something. And um, the engineers won't necessarily quite see what we're trying to do with the product. But then I often have said to them, you know, just let's just try it. Let's just see what we can do. And we, we try it a little bit and the engineer starts to see it and they see it more and then they say, oh yeah, that's, this is cool. This is, I never, you know, they wouldn't have thought of it. They wouldn't have done it, but now they get it, right? And how do we get to that need or set of features or whatever? We did it through usability research and, and testing and then kind of design, working with design um, principles and whatnot. Um, I would say similar, uh, issues exist for building, right? So we got this tile, but we didn't know how much um, or where we were gonna put it, but just as a, as a point of comparison, I hope that um, it's not too dark that you can see, but you can see over here, there's tile there, there's tile that goes all the way around and it wraps around, it goes up there and then it up here um, behind these shelves and then it wraps around behind me, you know, and um, I had a really interesting moment and I actually described to our installers um, this same thing. They didn't want to do this pattern of tile. Um, and it was a very, and I said to them, this is just like the kind of conversations that I have with software engineers, you know, where they're like, oh, we don't know. And so I said, why don't we just try it? over here and let's do two days and and put it in and take a look and once they had two days worth of tile put in um which was maybe 20 percent of the project they said oh yeah we get it okay this is really cool and then once it was complete and the grout was in now they come in and they're super proud but they never would have put this in this way and and had the look and feel and the whole thing and now they love it Right. And I, I actually find that kind of a process of, you know, your pair programming between usability, product development and the software stuff, you know, it's, um, this is, these are very related in a lot of ways. Um, but the guys trust me, they trust my design decisions and they've said every single time, you know, 
afterwards they're like you you're really good at this you know you really know how to create the usability the look and feel the high quality design and figure out how to get all the pieces in and and um kind of you know figure it all out which i guess leads me to also say you know i i don't think i'm necessarily the greatest in the world at any of this but I do think that, you know, there's as much art to all of these things, software or building, as there is a science and a rule set and codes and all of that, right? Um, yeah, it really is interesting how you've been able to take some software design principles and apply them uh, to the building mm -hmm. process. I also want to talk a bit about open standards around some, you know, some of the things that are going on around smart devices and things like that. I mean, mm -hmm. these are... I'm not sure how much of it is a safety concern, although if you're doing what I'm doing, which is, uh, you know, putting a microcontroller and a relay in the same box as my uh, uh, electrical switch, I guess there could be some concern there from a safety perspective. But that's kind of what I want to get to is where do, where are we with open standards around smart devices, you know, either for electricity, uh -huh. plumbing, you know, any of this stuff. And, and you know, is, is that an area that people might want to do some work in so that because I know like. You know, you have all these, we, we always have these different standards, right? X11, Zigbee, whatever. It's a whole mess, right? And it seems to evolve, but never land on, here's the standard, here's how we're going to communicate. You know, it's just kind of all over the place. Right. So, um, yes, I think there is a huge opportunity for open source and open standard development around smart products and and other kinds of products that are maybe quasi smart products um you know it's like with everything in tech right the huge impetus is to own the customer and control the customer and control the relationship and so you know you're getting a nest doorbell and uh you know everything's running or ring same thing you know you're running everything through um a giant company and uh they're collecting the information they're doing facial recognition um the software is proprietary uh it feels like when you have one like you barely even own what's happening at your door right mm -hmm. or or the copies of the the stuff and you know there's the barrier to entry for making hardware plus software, right, for any of these issues is high, whether it's my iPhone, you know, that's insanely expensive and, um, you know, that Apple makes a ton of money on, but it's really hard for other competitors to get into that business. I mentioned the I Created Fire t-shirt before we sort of got started, and, um, you know, that's the Fire Phone that Amazon worked on for two years and had six cameras in the front. And, you know, Amazon wanted to get into the high-end device and software business, right? Because look at what Apple's doing, right? Like this is a big profit center for Apple and they wanted to try to compete. And, you know, they made an $800 phone and it, the market just went, blah, you know, whatever, meh. Um, but it's, you know, so it's hard. So then you look at what happens in building, right? like like the the doorbell nest or ring like how many more people can afford to get into that market develop the hardware and then develop the open source software um maybe to make a competitor that's more open that we might be able to have a bit more say over how things work or what happens but i will give this other example which i think is really interesting it and that is um, video cameras for homes are kind of fascinating so we have a perimeter system it's made by swan um, they have a ridiculously poorly designed set of usability around their software um, but we don't have to run anything through a swan company that's outside of our house right so we're privacy advocates, as Doc mentioned, um, you know, customer comments and all of the things that I I focus on in my tech work um, is very much privacy oriented. So the way that we set up the SWAN system is we have the cameras outside. We don't have any cameras inside. We um, have a hard drive that is on a battery system that will run it for like a month and also the Internet. Um, which is fiber. And so therefore, if somebody cut the power or started clipping um, 
you know, wires thinking that they were going to shut this down, they would have a hard time because it's, they'd have to break into the house to, to do it, but they could do that and they could run off with the hard drive or the power boxes or the, the internet. But the um, video is copied to a, an encrypted secure um, thing in the cloud that we control and we don't share it with anybody. Um, and we don't even really look at it because we don't really care until there's an incident. We have had instances where the Mountain View police have come by and realized we had a really good camera and we're a block away from a bank and there was a bank robbery mm. and the bank robber drove down our street. And then they say, can we have that footage because it's part of our investigation and they can see the person and the license plate and the whole thing. So, you know, we don't mind sharing that at all, but we don't want the police to have everything all the time and be able to do a giant dragnet. So there's like a privacy consideration and then there's the functionality of it you know like how do you set this up it is not easy and and to think of these things that nobody's creating a system like what we made um we had to string it together and kind of hack it hack it into place um to do you know the physical meet the physical need of you know having cameras that would go around the building and you know, take care of security issues and then have a copy here that we can look at and then also have an encrypted copy in the cloud in case we lose what's here um, for one reason or another. And, um, you know, the Swan makes a really good camera. Their software is terrible, but there is a company, which I'm blanking on the name, but Sanford Dickerson, Dickerson wait, I'm blanking on, Doc knows him. He's from Jerry's group. Um, we met him Sanford through Jerry's Dickert. thing. And Sanford Dickert. Dickert. So Sanford yeah. has been working with um, a couple of uh, kind of um, startup incubators to incubate a company that um, is actually doing great work creating software that can be swapped in for what many of the other camera, camera manufacturers um, provide. But Swan won't use them. They're the only company, at least I believe, uh, until it, I, the last time I asked him was really, you know, a few months ago. Swan still won't won't do it because they're the leader in the marketplace. So what I'm trying to describe is, you know, there's what we wanted to do. There's what um, the market wants to do, which is just provide people with security cameras, right? And there's a whole bunch of manufacturers. So in other words, more breadth and depth than what is in the doorbell business for Ring and Nest. But, um, you know, how do you set it up? It's complicated for homeowners and people yeah. who are renters and things. And then you have this issue of, you know, here's somebody who's come along and who's making software that's better than what all the camera makers have, but the lead the lead seller of home video systems won't use it. And they have a really terrible UI. It's really hard to, to deal with it. And so what do I do? Because I'm not a coder and I'm not as technical as Ed is. Ed is the guy who goes in there, my partner, and he goes in and figures it out and, you know, gets the video out for the police if they come by or whatever, you know, for yeah. a couple of times. Well, like you months. said, there's a trade-off there, just, right? I mean, you, you know, he has to, like, I was just going to bring up the fact that there are open source projects that people can use to, you know, at least on the back end, you know, to, to, to monitor some of this stuff and interact with it. Open Hab is one. We did a show, uh, I just looked it up, it's Floss Weekly 312 back in 2014. We've been doing the show a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. But but Floss Weekly 312, we talked about Open Hab, which was pretty, pretty early on the scene. And then lately, Home Assistant has come out. And that one's a little bit more user-friendly, but you still... You know, you still have to even setting up a Raspberry Pi and running it on the Raspberry Pi as easy mm -hmm. as that sounds to some of us. That's not going to be easy for the mm -hmm. average homeowner. So, right. you know, it really is kind of a, a trade off back and forth versus, you know, making it easy for people. But then also, like you say, the privacy concerns, you know, because right. I don't want that's why I set up my own light switches with my own relays, even though I can get them from China. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I do get them from China. I just reprogram them. Uh, I don't know what how their software sets up and what their what information they're sending back to their servers. So I'm like, ah, we're just going to overwrite that software. I'm going to put my own software on it, right? Um, not that I'm a not that I'm a privacy wonk, but I am. I think everybody needs to be a little concerned about it. 
So yeah, it's a little bit of a, of a catch 22 there in terms of, uh, you know, knowing if you have the right technical resources yourself to go do this, or you go hire someone mm-hmm. to set it up, or you just rely on whatever Google or, or whatever vendor it is, is providing the, the functionality in your house. Right. But there is this concern also, besides the privacy issues that somebody might look at or, you know, mm-hmm. spy on you, there's also this concern that somebody might hack you and, uh, and use the right. information against you, right? Um, watch when you come and go and then take advantage of that. Or for example, another um, thing that I love that is you know, sort of quasi tech uh, and hardware it are door lock systems, right? Mm-hmm. So um, on this door here, we have a, sh- a schlag. Um, I don't know if we can, if it's possible to mm-hmm. see, but you can see the back of it you know, so the hundred year old door gets the um, very uh, modern, um, it's kind of dark there, but you can see the back of it, um, door system. And on the other side, there's a keypad, right? And you yep. can hook that to the internet. You can, you know, we could put that, um, it has a wireless connector and we could put it on the internet. And, uh, you know, I've read various reports about people door systems getting hacked and I don't really want that. So I won't put it on the internet and I'm not capable of doing what you did, which is to reprogram it. And Ed's busy writing software for his company. (laughs) Right. And so there's only so much of this that he can do. Um, We fixed the video cameras problem, which I think is more critical. And we're just happy to be able to punch in a code and I can give a different code to each of the workmen and, yeah, uh, you know, so everybody can be turned on and off as needed. And if anybody else is coming here, I can just do it. But I lose the functionality of being able to do it over my phone if I'm not actually physically located here. So it kind of sucks. But again, I'm stuck with the proprietary software and my own limitations, not being a coder myself and wanting certain functionality, but not really being it, you know, just saying, well, I'm going to forego it because there's a you know, security concern, a hacking concern, and I uh, want to be safe. So, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a problem, you know. I mean, that gets to the discussion of sort of the whole Internet of things, not just light bulbs and cameras and yeah. um, lock systems, but everything, you know, does, is my frid- refrigerator going to start talking to the Internet? I kind of like the fact that this fridge is – in many ways, relatively low tech, even though it's a few years old and it actually has a bunch of features um, and a whole software system. And it's got like a motherboard and a bunch of controllers and things. It's not on the internet and it's not, you know, it's, it's weird to me, the notion that somebody could get in and both track us, but also, you know, hack a system to be malicious, you know, and, uh, these things I don't feel are well. Um, I, I know that manufacturers are concerned about it. I've talked with manufacturers about these issues and, and salespeople, you know, who are kind of the face of selling those devices. But, you know, in, in the end, um, there's, there's few standards about how, um, uh, you know, these things are going to be made secure and also a desire to, you know, everybody wants to own their fiefdom. I mean, the manufacturers um, and and whatnot, the companies that make this stuff. So they're not really sharing, and they're not they're not doing as you know, working on an open standard that we could all look at and say, you know, yeah, you know, this is this is more secure. You know, they're doing sort of security by obscurity, as it were. Right? No one can see it, and then they just do it. And, People hope they don't get hacked. I don't know. It's a, it is a really, a really weird thing, and I'm not sure um, how much people get. And then, there, of course, there's the uh, obsolescence problem. Like, is your fridge going to die because you had this one little bit of, you know, stuff, and then you lose your fridge because the software went? I mean, it's, you know, we, fridges are expensive. <laughs> we 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 we're actually at the right right about at the end of the show, and. I was going to ask you a question around this. We really don't have time for it, so I'm going to, I'm just going to point people to something we'll put in the show notes. That, uh, to me, one of the greatest 
um, open source hacks of all time was the invention of what we now call frame construction, originally called balloon frame construction, because mm -hmm. the detractors thought it would blow, blow down. It was invented by Augustine Taylor and, and friends to build a church in Chicago in the 1830s. But everything has been built the same way ever since. It's basically like, you know, it's like, you know, somebody just invented a new way of doing things. And, and I think that's one of the things that happens with construction as well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's a, <laughs> yeah, it's showing one there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I put it, put a different link in, but it's true. Balloon construction is, is one of the things that just changed the world because it, it let everybody build. Before that, it was a very, very mm -hmm. much a, uh, uh, a specialist job. And all of a sudden, you know, because what were then called cut nails, the ones where you can tell it's an antique place because you have these square top mm -hmm. nails um, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and hammers and, and lumber mills basically invented the two by four. You know, once you had the two by four, it was cool. Anyway, um, so so we always wrap with uh, with three. <laughs> I just cut them down down to three questions. Um the the first is do you have anything to say and it can be as brief as you want about blockchain <laughs> <laughs> anything to say about blockchain well you know i uh i am a skeptic <laughs> uh, i'm very skeptical but i also think it's very interesting i think in many ways blockchain is a solution in search of a problem um, and so only rarely has it actually solved some really interesting things. But I do think since we went through the whole hype cycle and we, now we're sort of on the downturn and kind of uh, ruminating with what it can really do and how it can really be applied, there are some interesting projects about how um, we might actually solve a real problem with a real need using blockchain technology. I think now it's possibly yeah. getting more interesting. Yeah, I agree with you about that. Um, and, and the last two, uh, if you have them, your favorite, uh, 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 uh <laughs> scripting language and, uh, and text editor. Uh, well, as an, as a non software engineer, um, when I, back in the day, when I was at Berkeley getting my master's in information science, I did code some stuff in C uh, and um, <laughs> Java, and I would use Eclipse, which, you know, it's like uh, totally out of date, right? Um, that was from 20 years ago. And, but my, um, my favorite scripting language, um, again, I'm, you know, I mean, there's the things that, you know, the major companies use, Java, C++, you know, that um, Apple and, you know, Android are, are made on. And I, we end up using them because that's what you have to use, right, to build stuff. Um, I wouldn't say they're a favorite. <laughs> I don't know. That's, I mean, and they're totally cool. in many ways proprietary, but it's like I don't, you know. Yeah. So, so the, Mary, this has been fabulous. Um, it's been a quick hour <laughs> and, and we'll have to have you back when you're living in one place, <laughs> and, yeah. which I, and, and I'm saying is somebody who lives in three places right now as myself. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we live crazy lives. So thanks a lot for being on the show, Mary. Yeah. It's been great. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. It's great. <laughs> So, so Aaron, um, <laughs> how is that for you? <laughs> well, you know, there's a, there's a whole well of stuff we could talk about around this, uh, topic and, and we've covered some of it on Floss Weekly in the past. I mentioned open hab and, uh, some yeah, open hardware right. stuff that we've talked about. Right. Uh, and for anyone that's interested, uh, Tasmota, T-A-S-M-O-T-A -A, is the firmware that I use on my devices. And that is open source. So you can go mm -hmm. check that out. And they don't, they support a ton of devices. Now this guy's developed this, um, uh, software and you can, you can basically overwrite the firmware on your device and make it a bit more standard, um, so mm -hmm. that you can control what's going on. So if you're right, interested right. in reprogramming your devices that run primarily on ESP 32 microcontrollers, highly recommend checking out Tasmoda. Uh, but yeah, the whole, the whole topic is really interesting and, Really interesting some of the parallels around how you can use software uh, design methodologies to, you know, be your own independent contractor. 
Yeah, it's it's the it is in fact I think the world's oldest profession is building stuff. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it I is. I don't know. There's one other one. I will. We won't yeah, there's that. another one too, which is I don't know. <laughs> And probably, probably originally nobody got paid for either one, I suppose. <laughs> that is true. And I think probably the drug business is out, is 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 in there somewhere too. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but but yeah. I mean, I'm I've always been. I, I'm like the first. I'm the first in five generations on my father's side who was not a carpenter. I mean, I can oh, do wow. carpentry, but I'm not a. I, I've I've never been a carpenter by trade. It was my father right. was, and his father, and his father, and his father. It's uh, all these Searles going back to the early 1800s were all builders of various kinds. But I think you go back that far, everybody's a builder. You know, you yeah. can't help it. You're, you're, you're making do with what's there. Uh, That's right. And, it's, it's, um, uh, and th there's a book, I, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, it's, it's, uh, and it'll be in the show notes, Stuart Brand's How Buildings Learn. Um, uh, he goes into, it's wonderful. It's got lines in it like form follows funding. And, you know, how one of the greatest buildings of all time was MIT's Building 20, I think it was, which is this piece of crap building that they put up in, during World War II so all these guys could get together and design radar. And it, tur yeah. it turned out to be so useful they couldn't get rid of it for the longest time. Now it's the, the status center is there, you know, which is designed by Frank Geary and is beautiful, but not as practical as Building 20 right. was. And, yeah. um, and that's vernacular. And it's also low road. And that's... There's a lot to be said for that. I mean, the last house we built was what's called magazine architecture and high road and all all custom and very expensive and we wouldn't do it again. But, you know, you're, you're living and learning through all this stuff. And that's yep. really the thread, the thread that connects it. So, um, so, so any, anything to plug there before we... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been bringing it up, I guess, uh, the past couple of times, but my YouTube channel is uh, continuing to grow. Uh, I finally have a case for my Apple One replica. So I have a replica okay. Apple One and a replica case wow. now, which is great. Um, so it's wow. you know modeled on the Bite Shop case that was built by a contractor. And I tried to do a faithful reproduction. The stain didn't come out the way I wanted it to, but you know, it can't be can't that's okay. It's all DIY anyway, right? Uh -huh. Uh, so yeah, yeah, so I built the case if for you it. The use only it, thing I have stained anyway, <laughs> exactly. And it should, yeah. right. I mean, it's supposed to yeah. look that uh, vintage, but anyway, yeah. the only thing I have left now is to add a cassette and start loading programs. So that'll be on wow. the next episode in a couple of weeks. So if you're interested in retro computers, uh, go over to my channel, retro hack shack and subscribe. I'd love oh, to wow. see more floss weekly, uh, listeners over on that channel. I, I hope people are some, uh, people are watching this or should go back and watch this because you, uh, or just go, just go to your show. But it looks great. <laughs> it great. Really Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Thanks a lot. Um, and uh, next week, I'm, as usual, I'm unprepared with next week. Let me take a quick look <laughs> at, at who's on. Uh, let's see. Schedule. Uh, scroll down. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Adams. Oh, great. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh uh, Peter Adams is the guy that, that does the faces of open source. This is a guy who, just a photographer, took this up. Like he thought open source mattered and the people who are involved in making open source happen mattered. And I have to say that if you go to faces of open source online, I have used that to recruit a number of our speakers. <laughs> Keith Packard is one, for example. And there's some others I'd like to get who are on there. And I'm in there too with a picture that I think is one of the best pictures of me ever taken. And I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, so it must be good <laughs> anyway. So we'll see you next week, everybody. It's been great. Have you ever read a tech news story and thought to yourself, man, I would love to talk to the person who wrote this to find out more information. Well, that's exactly what Micah Sargent and I, Jason Howell, do each and every week on Tech News Weekly. We read the stories that matter to us, we reach out to the people making a break in the tech news, and we invite them on to tell their story. And you can find it at twit.tv. Look for Tech News Weekly every Thursday.